The riches of his grace over here at verse 9. He made it known to us that's according that pleases him. That's his good pleasure. That's what he purposed in himself. He planned it out himself. But what accompanies this is colon. Okay? Did you see that? Colon. The riches of his grace. The mystery is what? Then the dispensation of the fullness of times. Okay. Dispensation, what does that mean? Dispensation, what that means is actually like dispensing out. It's basically giving or administering to someone. So there are some hyper-dispensationalists that think that whenever the Bible talks about dispensation, that it means rightly dividing the word of truth. No, that's not true. That's not true. Now, we do believe in dispensationalism, okay? So don't get me wrong. We believe in rightly dividing the Bible versus to the right group of people and right time period. Amen. So we believe that... Uh, in that form of dispensationalism. But when we look at the text here at verse 10, when it talks about dispensation, that's not what it means over here. Right. The idea of dispensationalism is biblical and true, okay? But, it does, but you won't find that term in your Bible, dispensationalism. It's like the word rapture. It's biblical and true, but you won't find that word in your Bible. It's like the word Bible is true, but you won't find that word in your Bible. All right? You are not going to find Bible in anywhere in the Bible. So that's what you've got to understand. So hyper-dispensationalists, they're very simplistic dispensationalists. They're very amateurish because they overtly divide. They automatically think dispensation means divide, and all they focus on is dividing, dividing, dividing. Bible-believing dispensationalists, we're honest about it. We're honest that when we see dispensationalism, we'll divide it. But if we don't see any form of dividing or dispensationalism, we leave it alone. But hyper-dispensationalists, they insist on dividing everything because it ruins their uh, neat little system about everything of Paul's writing is specifically only to the Christian church and that a Christian cannot get any claim or promise outside of the Pauline epistles. That's wrong. You look at the... Every single book in your Bible, I would dare say pretty much you can find something there that a Christian can apply and learn from, whether doctrinally or spiritually or devotionally or historically. All right. Now, if we go over here at verse 10, so that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. All right. So at the point where God administers or gives out what? Of the fullness of times. So this one you can put as a time period when it talks about fullness of times. But you can't say dispensation is referring to that one. It's more like giving out and ministering. But what is he giving out and ministering over here? If you keep reading, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both with our, which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. See, that's what he's dispensing here. What he's dispensing here is that he's trying to collect and gather and minister everything all together where Christ can claim it. Where Christ can claim it. But basically the point is this. When time will be no more and it's fulfilled, so I don't know if you watch that on the board here, when time shall be no more, and everything is fulfilled over here. So I hope that you saw me saying that while I'm pointing at the board. Otherwise, you might get lost. Let me repeat it one more time and look at the board, please. When time shall be no more and everything is fulfilled here, now you get what fullness of times mean, right? See, that's what I meant. What God's going to do is uh, gather and dispense everything that's in all creation and put it in Christ. So now let's break it down. He might gather together in one. He's going to gather everything in one thing. All things in Christ. Everything in Jesus Christ. So there's going to so when time is fulfilled and it's no more, he's going to put everything in Christ. Both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So everything in heaven, everything on earth, it's going to go inside Jesus Christ. You see that? So, go to Revelation 22. This is the deep doctrine here that 
Dr. Uckman doesn't really go into, and he's not sure himself. And me, I'm not sure myself either. There's a book which you have to be careful, but the guy, he gets into dispensationalism and he gets really deep. It's called After the Millennium by Trench. Trench is the author and the, the booklet is After the Millennium or After the Thousand Years. That is a, that's a book that goes into really heavy doctrine on what's going to happen after the millennium and eternity. When I talked about Revelation 22, I really didn't get into that. But basically it's this. How the dispensation goes is that after the millennium, 1,000 years of Jesus Christ, if you recall Revelation 20 through 22, we have the great white throne judgment, as you might recall. After the great white throne judgment, then begins a point which, he, which we call eternity. And in eternity, that's where we reign with Jesus Christ forever and ever. But here's the thing. Larkin and others, which I don't know how they do it, and Dr. Altman still doesn't know himself, but he believes that when we hit eternity, that's where deep doctrine hits. What's going to happen within eternity? What's going to happen within eternity? In eternity, Larkin goes that there's going to be like a period of 33,000 years. A period of 33,000 years where we're ruling throughout all of creation separately. And you remember I taught you that at Revelation 22. I also included where, we're, where the millennial and tribulation saints, they're populating, right? They're yeah. populating throughout all of the universe. But then what happens after that? Larkin limits it to 33,000 years. And then the, some of the dispensationalists teach this. Then they talk about where everything is going to be gathered one together in Christ. So basically Christ, he takes up all of creation, puts it back in himself. And all of mankind and everybody goes back inside Jesus Christ. And that's how it ends. So that's what they teach. So the verse that they will use is this verse, verse 10 here. So in the dispensation of the fullness of time, see when time shall be no more, it's fulfilled, then what happens? Then God, he gathers everybody and everything in all of creation together and puts them inside Jesus Christ. Wow. Now let me uh, encourage you in this sense. The encouragement is, remember verse 9, he made known unto us the mystery of his will, right? Mm -hmm. Here is an extremely deep doctrine that God wants you to know, I would say. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, wow. You might say, why is that? Why would he want us to know that? Because he wants us to know what we'll be doing with him with all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That's according to the riches of his grace. Okay. Look at that context there. It's all connected, is it not? He made known unto us the mystery of his will which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together one in all things in Christ. See that? So God wants you to know that. Now, it's sad that a lot of people are infatuated in knowing more about the Antichrist yeah. and what will happen in the tribulation where they're not even here, if you're a safe Christian, right. rather than what they will be doing up there in eternity with God. They're not studying that one. If that's a deep doctrine, that's something you want to get into. Amen. All right, let's look at verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. So, based off of ver the last part of verse 10, in Him, right? Which is in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, verse 11, in whom, in Jesus Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance. We also gained an inheritance. Okay, so look at Revelation. Uh, I mentioned that to turn to Revelation 22. So your hand's already over there. So let me read this one real quickly. So verse 7, verse 7, Revelation chapter... Oh, it should be 21, I apologize. 21, verse 7. 21, verse 7. Now... So what God says is that we obtained an inheritance. So all of this is the riches of His grace. This is our inheritance. Why? Because we're going to gain everything. Everything. All the spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So look at this one. 
He that overcometh shall what? Inherit all things. All things of what? Look at verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, 4. That's, that's all of that, all of creation. Look back at Ephesians 1. It says, gather together everything in heaven and in earth in Christ. All of that is, is our inheritance. And people are working so hard just to grab a little bit of this world. You know how small that little portion of that earth is compared to everything in your eternity? Yeah. Everything you're going to get in the entire universe? That's right. The world is too small. That's right. The world is too small in comparison. So this is what we gained. That's an incredible blessing. However, there is something that we got to understand. Based off of Ephesians 1, we obtain this inheritance not through our works. It is done through, uh, through salvation by grace. However, there are portions in the Bible where it talks about us losing an inheritance. So let me give you a few examples. Yeah. Let's look at the book of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5. So then there seems to be a problem here. The problem is this. This is all based off of His grace. No doubt about that. No works. No works. But now there are portions in the Bible where your works do count, and if you fail in your works, you're not going to gain the inheritance. So there seems to be a contradiction here. And Paul's the same author. We're reading the same author here. So look at Galatians chapter 5. And notice what the Bible says at verse 21. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall what? Not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at that. This is based on what you do, your works. So you're not inheriting it, but Paul says you are in, uh, inheriting at Ephesians 1. So here's the thing over here is that Ephesians 1, this is based off of predestination. So that cannot be undone. This is based off of um, adoption, which cannot be undone. This is based off of grace, which cannot be undone, which means zero works. So then what's the confusion over here? Go back to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. Remember, Romans 8 and Ephesians 1, they go hand in hand here. The latter part of Romans 8 tells you all the promises, just like Ephesians 1, but the first half of Romans 8 tells you here there's a division between flesh and spirit. And when you follow the works of the flesh, then you can lose your inheritance. But I thought that it's irreversible. We can't lose this inheritance. There are two. Yeah. There are two. That's the key over there. There are two. Ephesians 1, as you might recall, all of that is based off of in God, the Father. God the Father. Why? Because He provided this salvation for you. Since He provided this salvation for you, God the Father predestinated and it's irrevocable. However, there's another thing where you're a joint heir with Christ. This is based off of God the Son. So there's your other inheritance. It's based off of God the Son here. And in God the Son, it's based on a condition of your works. You have to live accordingly. Look at Romans chapter 8. Verse 17. Well... Verse 16, by context, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the what? Children, children of God. God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. So notice that verse 16 and 17, that has to be irreversible, right? Yeah. Because God made us His children. If God made you His children, then that's evidence. The Spirit is the evidence. He bears witness that you will be heirs, right? So you're going to gain the inheritance of God. But look at the next part of verse 17. The next part of verse 17 shows there's a condition. And joint heirs with what? Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may, all, that we may be also glorified together. See that? So the inheritance that's based on God the Son here is based on the condition of how much you sacrifice. 
how much you suffer for him. So over here is based on your efforts, what you do. This one over here is simply by faith where God gives you his grace. So that's why Paul, he points out that we did obtain an inheritance that's irrevocable, but in other passages, he points out that if you live according to the flesh, you will lose your inheritance. But that inheritance is based off in Jesus Christ over here. It's based off of Jesus Christ. Plus, you cannot deny 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3 is the greatest evidence that here's somebody that's inheriting something, but he loses it all, but he's still a saved Christian. Yeah. And that's according to his work. It's according to his work, 1 Corinthians 3. So that one is undeniable. You can't go around that text. That's why the Bible says it's not the, judge, it's not the judgment seat of God. It's the judgment seat of what for the Christian? Christ. Because it's based on Jesus Christ here. Based on Jesus Christ over here. All right. Now let's go back to our main text. Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So it, there is a big deal with the word God and Christ. Judgment seat of Christ. Judgment of God. A lot of people say judgment of God. And they confuse all the three to five different judgments together. But the Bible says is that, no, there's a difference with the judgment seat of Christ and then the judgment of God, which is right over here, the great white throne judgment. Amen. All right. So here's the idea. The idea is this. We do inherit all things, but notice that this takes place throughout the time of eternity here. Then when does loss take place, right? Loss will have to take place right over here during the millennium. Why? Why is it during the millennium? Because in our, if you studied our Revelation studies, I'm not going to really get into that, but I'm just going to make it brief over here. All right? So basically, in the 1,000-year millennium, this is where we're reigning with Christ. Based off Romans 8, joint heir with Christ. Yeah. And then if you look at Revelation 2 and 3, God warned the Laodicean church that uh, your gold based on the judgment seat of Christ, your clothing based on the judgment seat of Christ, your crown based on the judgment seat of Christ, it's all lost. It's all lost over there. So if you think that, well, I got all these riches, I'm going to get everything anyway, so I could just sin whatever I want. Listen, man, a hundred years of your life compares to ten times of that. That's definitely not worth it. This is still a great loss over here. Yeah. For some of you to live up the best that you want according to the pleasures of your flesh for a hundred years of your life, if you get to live that long, on, my goodness, man, that's still very small, minuscule compared to this. Yeah. 